Welcome to Reach, your platform to connect with other executive assistants and acquire game-changing knowledge and perspective. Reach is designed to inspire your workday, guide you through pivotal moments in your career, and transform you into the executive assistant you've always wanted to be. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Reach. This is your host, Jessica Van. I'm the founder and CEO of Maven Recruiting Group. And today I have been already laughing it up and enjoying myself with the lovely Catherine Estep. Hi, Catherine. Hi. Thank welcome. you for having me. Thank you for um, being here and drawing me out of my cocoon to come and meet you in person. It's so fun. It's so fun. I'm glad we navigated through the weather. Yes, we had hail and all kinds of things prior to our arrival. Catherine currently supports the CFO at Udemy with all things related to executive operations. For those who aren't already familiar with Udemy, their mission is to inspire learning in a massive global way, learning and education vis-a-vis their online and on-demand platform for accessing really just an incredible depth and variety of courses available. It's, It's really pretty incredible. By way of background, Catherine joined Udemy the month that they announced their IPO and has been supporting their CFO ever since the company became publicly traded on NASDAQ. Prior to this role, Catherine worked as an executive assistant to the CEO of a biotech research company, Zimmergen, for five years, where she also helped take them public in 2021. All true so far, right? All true so far. (laughs) You've nailed it. Great. So if you're a regular listener of our program, then you know that we've interviewed several guests who support executives at various stages of startup and organization. And one of the things that we like to do on our program is really unpack some of the nuances that are associated within the EA role across different industries and across different stages of organizational maturity. We've already spoken about what's involved in actually taking a company public from the EA's perspective. And today, thanks to Catherine being our guest, we'll be discussing the specific responsibilities that an EA working in a now publicly traded company has to handle and be prepared to handle. So that is the topic of the hour. So Catherine, you joined Udemy in October of 2021, and that happens to be the same month that Udemy went public. That's some crazy timing. I can imagine that what you thought it would be like to come and work for this company as a late stage startup was ultimately something different when you learned that the company was actually going public. Um, I guess I'm curious to know, how did that announcement shift your understanding of what you thought you were walking into (laughs) versus what you actually encountered? Yeah, well, it, it shifted it a lot. I mean, when I accepted the role, I had hopes that the company was going to go public while I was there just because I had been on such a wild ride at Zymergen and was able to really support a leader from a B all the way through an IPO. And it was an experience that I loved and wanted to get to do again if I was going to be given the opportunity. However, you know, in full transparency, when I joined and my boss told me, you know, as soon as she was legally allowed to, that they were going public, it was happening so quickly that my ability to have as much impact through that process was, I would say, hindered in a little bit of a way because I didn't know the organization. You know, I was still trying to onboard in a remote role during a pandemic, getting to know the team and the stakeholders. So it was really different um, having sort of a more of a back a back seat in that process. Um, and my role changed because everything that I thought I was going to be doing in my first 30 and 60, 90 days really got tossed aside. And suddenly it was everyone all hands on deck to the IPO, which basically for me meant trying to learn who the key stakeholders were and partnering with folks who were critical to that um, that path, I guess, coming to fruition by really getting to know also the other EAs, right? Like the EA to the CEO, who was really, really handholding through that process was so instrumental to just helping me know like, today's here's what's happening and we're going to clear X, Y, and Z. And yeah, I think that was probably the wildest thing to be told probably within a week of starting. 
it also helped was like kind of funny that my boss texted me the week before I started and was like, I'm so excited you're joining. Like, welcome. Happy first day. And I was like, oh, my God, did we get our wires crossed? I, I don't start for another week, but if you need me to, like, I'm here. But there was now that I know what was going on, it makes sense, right? There was so much happening that everybody needed everyone. And it probably would have been better if I could have started a week earlier, but I couldn't. So, yeah, that's that's very fair. So. How does the EA role change overnight with this type of an exit? I can imagine that in particular, as someone who's supporting a CFO, I mean, I think in any IPO, there are obviously there's there's a huge ownership and a huge responsibility on all of the C-levels. But I would say in particular, the, the, the crux and the brunt of that responsibility is really borne by the CEO and the CFO. So I'm curious to know uh, how your role changes overnight and what what new things you encounter? Yeah, I think from from the very beginning, the role changed once I knew that we were moving towards going public in such a, a, what felt like a quick time to me because I was so new to the organization. But I think the reality of it is the role didn't necessarily change overnight. Like the process takes a little bit of time, right? There's a lot of dealing with the roadshow and NASDAQ and all of those things. And so I think for me, I still was really focused on my onboarding. Mm -hmm. Like I was trying to just learn, like, what do I do? What are the daily tasks? What does this look like? And so for me, it didn't necessarily feel like it changed overnight because I was never settled in that role. Mm -hmm. Right. It was, it just was suddenly the new way that the job was going to start versus like having been settled and, and really like knew my executive. We barely knew each other at that point. So it was a lot all at once. Yeah. Well, and I think that's really important to to maybe um, elaborate a little bit further on, because I think we as members of the public, and I'm including myself in that in that group, you know, we read headlines and we go, oh, well, such and such company was just acquired or such and such company just went public. And we see that as kind of the finale event, as opposed to it being oftentimes the start of a process. And so I think especially like with acquisitions, you know, that is that can be a really lengthy process and something might hit the headlines. Such and such company acquires so and so. And we all think that the, that the liquidity event has happened. It's transpired and it's done. And it's actually not. It can go on for I mean, depending upon the complexity, depending upon what um what what their qualifiers are and kind of what their benchmarks are. I mean, it, it could literally go on for over a year, right, before everything is ultimately finalized, said and done. So I think that's a good point that you make, which is that um, it d- might not change overnight. It might change over time. I think that's exactly right. I think you hit the nail on the head with that. It's that the role changed over time and, it, and it's continuing to change as we're continuing to be a public organization. Things are still evolving. And I think the main difference that I've I noticed is that when you're private versus when you're public is that the time horizon changes so much. And I think that's something that I really started to understand when I was at Zymergen, being at a company that was so focused on science and developing in a deep tech space. You're talking pre-IPO and horizons that are you know, two to five years off because that's how science evolves, right? It's it's a very slow kind of my, like little changes over time that lead to really revolutionary things. But the market doesn't work that way and you're reporting on a quarterly basis. And so learning how to operationalize and have material things that are important to speak about on that cadence can be really challenging to like find the operational rhythm. Yeah. Well, and it certainly does put a different level of kind of pressure and perspective when you dissect your life and your world into increments of three months and you you think about like, wow, it's Q1, it's Q2, here we go again. Um, I mean, there's a cyclicality to it that I think um, is, is worth talking about and noting because it really does kind of have this sort of internal momentum and push. Absolutely. Early on in joining Udemy in our early quarters, um, for me, it was my first time really getting to be as heavily involved in that process. I wasn't with, I left uh, Zymergen within less than six months of their IPO and joined Udemy. And so getting to like really see what that work stream and the process looked like and 
how far out does the prep work start and and what does that actually um, entail from all of the different parts of the organization was fascinating. It was sort of like, you know, lifting up the hood of a car and looking in and getting to be a part of that. Um, I'm very grateful and thankful we have an amazing head of IR now who really has operationalized what that process looks like. Because when I first joined and and that wasn't the case, um, I was left uh, trying to kind of help put the pieces together and understand how to work towards those markers and those milestones. And now it's like a very well oiled machine. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about that. I mean, let's talk about some of these intricacies and some of these things that as someone working in a publicly traded company, what are the what are the added layers and responsibilities that show up for you now that didn't show up when you were, let's say, um, at Zymer Gym pre IPO, right? So I, yeah. I'm I'm curious, like what what that you mentioned. One of them is you know investor relations and, and kind of figuring out all of those pieces. But it seems to me like, and I'll let you respond to this. But it's just it seems to me that when you work in a publicly traded company, kind of the holy grail of everything is the stock price. The stock price, the stock price, the stock price, the stock price. <laughs> Are the shareholders happy? What's happening with the stock price? Where is it going? What's what's affecting it? There's just there's this whole kind of orientation around the stock price. So I'd love for you to just talk a little bit more about some of those responsibilities and maybe some of the different language and things that show up. Sure. I think something I always like to emphasize when I talk about sort of my career journey, which is not all that often, but it is with friends and family. And I think in so many ways, the pre-IPO company experience was so valuable to making me feel comfortable to join a company that is now public. I think what you learn in the scrappiness of being in a startup when you're given the right exposure is tremendous. And I think without that, I would be very lost in my job today. Um, But what I think that's so interesting about being a part of a public company and sort of what you're talking about of like what's different and what changes is that getting to see and understand how the business functions is much more important in my role today than I, not that it wasn't important in my last job, but there was just a different level of urgency when I was working for my last CEO, you know, it was, what do you need and what do you need now and how quickly can we get it done? And so I think what I have a tremendous amount of respect for now is that as we go through like the prep work before earnings is understanding what's happening operationally to know when the meetings that we need to have to kick off different work streams can actually happen. I remember my first time like when I was starting to try to help put together an earnings playbook. I laugh now thinking about it because I just didn't even know what that meant or what was really happening in order to set up the right cadence of meetings with the right stakeholders and recognizing that there are actually certain firm timelines and dates that need to have happened for the right metrics and data points that we want to look at are actually even available. And so that meeting that maybe I thought was going to be on a Tuesday because it looked better for everybody else's schedule, (laughs) in theory, is going to be a meeting where there's nothing tangible to talk about because it actually can't happen till the following Tuesday because of X, Y, and Z, you know, teams need to look at the date. So that's been really different for me is like actually being able to get to understand and dive in to the operational uh, c- cadence and rhythm of an organization and the mm. way that that reports out um, where I didn't necessarily have that as much in a startup because it always felt like you're sprinting, you know, and there's not really that rhythm yet. Built. Yeah, no, that, that's that's so insightful and in that it it's much there's m- many more people at play, many more considerations. It's not just a matter of looking for the the blank space on the calendar, or optimizing for time management or context shifting or whatever. It's actually, no, there's concrete information that we need to have and it needs to be reviewed by certain people. So that right there is a great example of one of the very big differences. So what else would you find in this earnings call playbook? It's a lot of, um, I think it's still something that I, we need to continue to build upon, but I would say that most of what's covered in that is really it's like a, a timeline is how I think about it. Like I think of my role as helping support as sort of a project manager and making sure that we're working to meet the next steps in the timeline so that we have all the right information syn- synthesized and put together so that when our e-staff leaders are brought in and, and ready to, to like start putting together your script and all of that, everything's ready, right, for them. But it's really, it's has so much data and so much 
Hmm. like financial metrics and all of that that you need in order to even start sort of crafting the story of the quarter. That's a good way of putting it. So it's the story of the quarter and it's the look back. I think so. Yeah. So for those who don't know, because I imagine that there are some people listening that are going, let's start with the basics of what, like, what is an earnings call mean? What, what is an earnings call and who's typically a part of that? Yeah, that's a great question. And who are you calling, by the way? I know. Sometimes, <laughs> yeah, who are you really calling? Um, so for a typical earnings call, I think that most of the time in the room, it's your CFO, your CEO. Occasionally, you'll have your general counsel. It just depends. Always your head of IR. Um, and then you have whoever is on the other side of that line moderating the call. And so the way that it happens is it's there's a pre-recorded call where your two, two leaders, usually the CEO, CFO, read through like the earnings script, right? And that's where you go through all of the metrics and the data and really give like the summary of everything. And that happens usually a couple of days prior. Then you finalize that, button it all up, sort of like this. You make sure that the, you know, the sound quality is good and all of that. And then from there, you go on your quote unquote earnings call that goes out. And then after that, it's open to a QA. and a And so the way that that goes is it's moderated by the third party that's a part of that call and different investors and analysts are on the call. And so they are able to ask open questions to um, both the CEO and the CFO. Mm. And are shareholders also a part of that? I don't think typically they are. Okay. Um, I don't think you would necessarily open it up that way, but that could be something that I'm wrong about. So I would definitely encourage us to look that up. <laughs> um, but I've never seen it where we've had that Got it. case. And so that's where that what you were talking about earlier about the narrative of the quarter and kind of what is the narrative that we're telling and how are we talking about whatever um, transpired. That's where all of that really becomes relevant. And for whatever may ensue on that call, whether it's like great stuff and praiseworthy or if it's questions about what happened, it sounds like it's very much like being ready for whatever may unfold in the in that in that conversation. Exactly. And I think that that's why the prep work is so important because you have to be able to think through what are the kinds of things that we think that our um, analysts and investors are going to ask about, right? And trying to make sure you've thought through those questions and have prepared yourself to be ready to answer it because those are live calls. So right. you don't get to edit those questions out and it can be really challenging. Yeah. And I think if we take it one step further and think about kind of abstracting in your work as an EA, really understanding how that frequency and that rhythm impacts all of the other broader thinking that you're doing about planning for their world, their life, what they can take on, what they can't take on. I mean, those become pretty significant anchor points throughout the year that you then have to kind of reverse into in terms of thinking about other things that your executive could potentially do and keeping that in balance. So I, I think that's really interesting that it, it kind of defines in many ways, I would assume, sort of the pace and trajectory for the year. Oh, absolutely. Especially because when you're going, like when you're a public company, you have the period in which you're able to be out and talking and like going through the earnings process. And then you have what's also known as a quiet period, right? Where you're not able to be out there talking about the business as much or with as much, um, I guess, transparency in some ways. And so even just knowing and understanding that has been so important because oftentimes, you know, with our leaders being very visible in, in especially in the tech space here in the Bay Area, they get a lot of inquiries to come and speak at events and to speak at a conference. And sometimes it's unfortunate because the timing won't work out because it's, you know, we're in our quiet period. So we maybe mm. can't do it at that point. Um, and that's just a partnership that I've now been working on with our legal team to make sure that we actually like we're, we're falling in line with all of all of that. Um, because when we were and I was working at Zymergen and we were private, that was not the case. I never really thought about that. If we hadn't, you know, if Forbes reached out and it was a really interesting opportunity to have like an interview, of course, that would be amazing. And I never even had to think of that. Whereas now I, there's just a lot, um, a lot more things to think about all at the same time and different timelines to your point about how sort of these dates, once they're set, they really do drive like even just periods of time in the business where I am trying to just manage, like recognizing like, okay, this might be a month or a few weeks where we really need to try to, I need to be carving out time just like 
thinking time. Like just block out like these, you know, you can't be in meetings the week or two weeks before all day long. Like right. she needs to do strategic work and be thoughtful. And so that's been an added layer that is very different from the pace of a startup. Yeah, that's so interesting. And it's so subtle. And that's what I love about it. Because it's, how would you know that? I mean, you unless you've worked in a public company, how would you know about these quote unquote, quiet periods where it would be um, not permissible to be, you know, speaking to a reporter or the public or whatever, or being at a conference as a keynote or whatever the case may be. So there's, there's so many considerations that ha- now have to filter through your brain as her executive assistant and the person in charge of all exec operations to really know what's appropriate or what's not appropriate. Never mind things like vacation planning and an actual fitting in life, right, in in the midst of all of that other stuff. So that's a really, really great takeaway. And I love um, I love the subtlety of that. Yeah, and it makes sense, you know, as I'm as I'm listening to you, it's it makes sense too why a lot of our clients, if they're looking for like, let's say they are a public company, and they're looking for an EA, it makes sense to why that often becomes a pivot point in the search where they want that experience and sometimes are willing to forfeit it, you know, for, for in certain conditions or for, for certain people. But oftentimes it becomes kind of a pivot point for the discussion. And I can see why, because there are some definite concrete, really tangible things that you either have learned because you've been in that environment or you don't don't know them yet. That's, I mean, I think that's absolutely true. I would encourage anybody sort of with the mindset of only wanting to look at people to be in like in roles of support at public companies having had that experience. I would encourage people to be willing to be a little more open about it only because I think it's very learnable. Like I think mm-hmm. if you have the right exposure and you have the right partners and stakeholders in the organization who are willing to give you access and share that information with you, a really skilled EA can absolutely learn how to be successful in that environment. And I wasn't, like I said, at Zymergen for a super long time post IPO. And so a lot of this was even new to me. And it's been an amazing journey so far. Yeah, I agree. And I appreciate that. And obviously, I mean, being a good student, being astute, being observant, asking the right questions is is a super valid point. And it's not that it, it's unlearnable. And that's Again, that's why we like to do programs like this one so that if someone is going up for an interview or they are being considered, this will give them some additional understanding and, and therefore ammunition in terms of how to enter into that conversation successfully. But I agree. I think, you know, higher on the intangibles and, and the rest will come. But yeah, it does. I just, just from experience, it does sometimes come into the conversation. So... What about like additional pressures or sensitivities? Have you felt a different sense of pressure in certain ways working in a publicly traded company versus non? I pause because I think about what the pressure feels like now versus what it felt like at a like a, a startup and I think it's they're just different pressures, right? I think the pressure that I feel now is that we are a public organization, and so there's just more visibility, right? Like even doing something like this, I was had to be thoughtful about sort of like what do I, you know, what can you say and what's not appropriate. And whereas in the startup, the pressure felt like it was much more of doing everything that you could to keep the company like alive, right? We mm-hmm. I went through so many rounds of fundraising while I was at Zymergen, and that was a very valuable experience to get to be a part of that. And I think that um, the pace was like the pressure felt like it was just always needing to move faster and trying to get as much done as you could and squeeze it all into the same day. Whereas now it feels like the pressure is, is building a long-term viable business that's successful. That gives people the opportunity to continue learning through our online platform. Like that's just more of like something I feel personally, because I think it's such a valuable um, organization. I, I think it's just like changing people's lives through, through learning is a great mission. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the day-to-day pressures in my job are not the same. I just don't feel that same sort of maybe frenetic energy. I think that we're a more developed organization in the sense that, you know, we're over a thousand people, I think globally, and we have really brilliant folks in the right roles and having that, it takes a little bit off of you, right? Because you know, 
that there's somebody who's going to catch the ball and there's a teammate you can work with Mm -hmm. to get things done successfully. What about when it comes to your role in interfacing with Wall Street or shareholders? Do you have exposure there? And if so, what does that look like? And how does that, for instance, impact things like comms? Or do you work closely with the comms team? So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that side of it. I absolutely can. And I would say my exposure at at being at a public company at Udemy is different than it was like at Zymergen. And so because we have an awesome head of IR, that's he's the person and the point person who primarily is going to interact with all of our shareholders and also with like the investors and analysts. And like he really is that first layer of communication. And he works very closely with the comms team. They like that's a really close relationship. Um, it's different. I think pre IPO, I've seen it at a lot of organizations where the EA role is really instrumental in being a part of the conversations and in helping build relationships with different investors and working very closely, even with the the banks when you're doing rounds of funding. Like I can recall being on the phone at all hours, just like trying to set up investor meetings for our B and C. Whereas now I feel like we have a, it's a much more, I would say professionalized setup. So it sounds like you don't necessarily yourself interact with Wall Street types of situations, but there's there's other people that are kind of leading that charge and absolutely yeah. and yeah. and that person um, and I you know we were in constant communication right like we yeah. have a, a biweekly meeting where we always go through everything to make sure we're really staying in lockstep with each other right. to make sure that anything that's coming up that has to do with investor relations, like it's flagged and he and I are aligned to make sure that the right players are prepped and ready to go. Here's a fun one. Have you ever had anybody maybe try to get around the IR person by kind of backdooring and and maybe reaching out to you in the hopes that you'll provide information? I think I'm lucky enough to say that I haven't had anybody try to do a little sneaky. Yeah, um, sneaky sneak. Yeah, that hasn't (laughs) happened yet. I, I'm sure it will one day, but I will happily guide them over to <laughs> the right person. Because I think, like, to your point, that is one of, like, the added layers of pressure of being at a public company is making sure you are following the right order of operations and not stepping into a little bit of a messy situation because there's a lot more at stake in that way. Yeah, definitely. More more eyes, more attention, more people invested. and you Exa- know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, it's not to say that... When you, if you make a mistake in, in a private organization, there aren't very serious ramifications, but it's just a different level of visibility. Yeah. Okay. Great. So what about in terms of kind of just experientially, right? You as an employee, um, maybe less about in support of a CFO and what that looks like, but just more in terms of you as an employee. How has your employee experience been different in these different types of environments? Wow, hard comparison to make only because my last experience was pre-pandemic, fully in office. And Mm. so now being in a more hybrid environment um, in my newer organization, the employee experience is just like night and day. I mean, but both are so valuable and we're so good. I, I, that's a really hard one because I have so much love for both of my roles in my organizations. Like, the experience has been really positive, I think, in both situations. I think for me now, what's different uh, or worth highlighting, I would say, as like the employee experience is being a more globally dispersed company is a newer experience for Mm -hmm. me. And so even just like interacting with, you know, people from all over the world has been very different in the sense that I'm working and learning to build relationships. You know, there's two people on are like my executive operations team who are over like overseas. I have a colleague in Dublin and one in Australia and that's new Mm -hmm. and fun and exciting. But I think overall they're hard comparisons for me to make just because so much is so different. Yeah. It's not just the public versus non-public thing. It's in office versus remote versus hybrid versus international versus it's just, yeah. It's just a lot there to to probably unpack. I mean, I do think maybe a little bit about, being a private or in a public company that's different is even just sort of like the energy around earnings is is kind of fun. You know, people get excited and want to listen in and 
just hear a little bit more from like the leadership and listen to the Q and A with analysts because it's something that you don't. We're not the general company isn't focused on that during that entire process, right? It's a very specific group of people that are in that work stream working towards that. But the rest of the folks are, are running the day-to-day business that has to keep going so that it makes sense to have an earnings call, right? Right. And so I think that's fun and it's celebratory and feels like a, 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 a touch point for people to kind of come together when we are still in this like remote hybrid world. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good, it, I guess it's kind of a, a clear point that people can sort of organize around. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we touched on this before about, you know, how to navigate an interview process. Let's say it's with a publicly traded company. You as the candidate have never been in a publicly traded company. How would you recommend that somebody preparing for that conversation go about it? And what sorts of things should they maybe speak to or think about or pull upon in terms of their experience that might help position them effectively? Yes, absolutely. That's something that I think is definitely worth talking about, especially given that um, I went through that kind of interview process. <laughs> you sure well, did. Not as, with, not, with some public experience, but not as much as I'm sure some people would have been looking for. Um, I think for me, it's really valuable to highlight maybe some of the big milestones that you helped a company uh, reach. So for me, that was talking about going through various rounds of fundraising. I also think that it's important if you've had any sort of interaction with working with a board and liaisoning with those types of folks, um, sort of just like key stakeholders or maybe high value individuals to the organization is something that would, I think, show or build trust while you're interviewing with um, with whoever, like whoever's on that panel, right, to show them that you are able to navigate challenging situations. I think so much about being successful in these roles is being able to navigate a lot of ambiguity and uncertainty with high stakes but using sound judgment. And I think that that's probably one of the hardest things to also screen for. But I think if you speak to like specific examples and scenarios, that always transfers, I think, across interview panels and Zooms and all of those things. Yeah. And I I think like to your point, people are capable of learning these things. Part of it is just kind of getting clued into what the nuances are. But I think if you can speak to your ability to assimilate knowledge and information and to parse context and be able to kind of know and glean what you need from a situation, that's a lot of what you're doing, right? You're parsing knowledge. You're assimilating all of these new, you know, new subtle things you had to learn and adjust to. So if you can talk about your ability to do those things and how you've done them, I think that's going to give you the best shot you got, right? Short of having the actual definitive definitive experience. I think so. I think and I think that's so much of what being in in EA is, right? Is so it's like being able to show up and be curious and want to learn and grow, I think is so much of what makes people really successful in the role and also is what probably drives a lot of us to the job is that no two day like two days is really ever going to be the same so there's always an opportunity to dig in and do more and create more impact and I think like when you're at a public company you can absolutely continue to create space for this role I think some people um, when I talk to them about being an EA at a public organization feel like oh would that be more limiting because there's more sort of boundaries or or like guardrails put up in some ways in the role and I actually find that it's not that way. If you, yeah, if you can speak to the role and and show that there's impact and value, I think people are really still receptive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. So I have a final question for you, Catherine. I think <laughs> you, I know what's coming. Are you excited or dreading it? <laughs> I'm excited, be, mostly because I think my answer might really surprise you. Ooh. Well, I don't, I don't know Whoa. what you would think it would be. The suspense. <laughs> uh, okay. So if you could support anyone throughout the course of history or time, who would you choose and why? Do you want to take a guess? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Gee, how many That's people have walked on this planet? <laughs> okay. Just Just you don't have to. Um, it's Julia Child. I love her. Same. And I think it's, I thought about this a lot because I was trying to imagine like, who would that person be for myself? And if I had that opportunity and 
I kept coming back to her. Because, let me tell you why. I think it's worth explaining. Otherwise, it's a little bit like that feels random. I love cooking. It's one of my favorite things. Like I grew up in a household where my mom was a stay-at-home mom and she cooked every meal for me and my sister. And so I have tremendous respect for the at-home chef. And Julia Child, most people don't know, she kind of started actually as an assistant because she wanted to be in the military and didn't get the opportunity because – she was too tall. She's like six foot two. Mm-hmm. And she ended up working for an agency as an assistant, which is now known as the CIA, and was sort of a spy before her cooking career took off. And then she was so instrumental in creating space for women to continue, like being in, you know, she was the first woman to, t- to go to her cooking school at La Cordon Bleu. And so she's just a tremendous human all around. But the cooking piece is what brings me back to her all the time because. I always want to try a new recipe and challenge myself. And I think getting, if I could have lived in that time, to shadow her and learn and just like help her slice her butter would have been amazing. I love that answer. And you're right. I never, even if you gave me 10 tries, I would not have guessed that. Um, But she's such a trailblazer, Mm -hmm. like literally such a trailblazer. And her propensity to consume butter is just like, was like no other. No <laughs> I've other. I so like, admired that about her and her ability to live a really long and productive life in spite of all the butter consumption. Yes, she attributes her long life to her love of red meat and gin. So, love it. Okay. Yeah, no, she was a total character. I That's know. a great answer. It makes me want to go watch that <laughs> movie now and <laughs> cook something really fabulous for dinner. Yes, and massage some kale. Yep. You know where I'll be today. <laughs> Thank you so much, Catherine. This was a delightful conversation. And I think there were some really great um, takeaways and nuggets for people who are thinking about some of these differences. Um, thank you for, for being willing to share some of the things that you've learned along the way and the bumps that you've had to, you know, navigate to, to learn and have the knowledge that you have. So thank you for sharing this. This was really a delightful and educational Wonderful. conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Reach is brought to you by Maven Recruiting Group, who specializes in placing executive assistants and support staff to the Bay Area's most prominent executives and companies. If you've enjoyed being part of our podcast community and are interested in becoming part of our candidate community, we're currently hiring for roles in San Francisco, Silicon Valley, and Los Angeles. You can visit us at www.mavenrec.com to see some of the roles we're currently working on and to submit your resume.